Uh, welcome everyone to our CRG's first online course, Leading Refugees, Leading Migration, uh, teacher, uh, an online orientation course for college and university teachers. This specific course is funded by the Institute for Human Sciences, Vienna, and is part of CRG's ongoing program on migration and post-migration studies, funded by Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, Institute of Institute for Human Sciences Vienna, and in collaboration with many universities and institutes in India and elsewhere. We have reached the seventh lecture of uh, our course, which seems quite a remarkable achievement to me, uh, but we've also right at the middle of uh, the road for us. And it gives me immense pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Paula Banerjee, uh, to everybody, and but I also assume everybody knows her already, because uh, Professor Paula Banerjee is best known for her work on women in borderlands and women and post-migration studies. However, in her different avatars, she has occupied several very important posts. She has been the director of Calcutta Research Group, the honorary director. She has been the vice chancellor of the Sanskrit College and University, and she has been the president of the International Association for Studies in Post migration. I am not going to repeat the many things Professor Banerjee has written because that's a long, long list. Currently, she is professor at the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies, University of Calcutta, and is simultaneously working on two books, probably three books. Uh, Margins of Protection is one. Another book on citizenship uh, in South Asia with uh, Dr. Nasreen Chaudhary, who was our speaker last week and probably a third book which takes into account CRG's ongoing research uh, from last year about the burdens and the borders of the epidemic. Uh, so welcome, Pallavi, and the floor is now yours. Thank you so much. Hello, all of you. Hello, hello. Hello, ma'am. You can switch on the camera, that'd be lovely. Then I can put a face to the name. And, uh, you know, I know some of you, I don't know all of you. But, uh, you know, I always, as a feminist, I always collect, connect personally. You know, for me, everything is personal. Personal is politics. So that's why I wanted to have a look at you all. Okay, now you can switch off your cameras if you want to. You see, the problem with me is I probably can do research and theories, but uh, I am much better as a storyteller. So I will start with, a, you know, some narratives. These are not stories. These are, these are very sad things that happened just a year back, slightly more than a year. My narrative will start from the 24th of March, 2020. We all remember that day when Narendra Modi, our prime minister, appeared on television and said that the novel coronavirus, COVID, COV, or SARS-2, whatever acronym, whatever full names you want to say, is here in India. And we have to go on a lockdown within four hours. This lockdown was not at all well thought out, as we all know. And within a couple of days, um, you know, all the bus stations of Delhi, Mumbai, you know, the, the normal picture was thousands of people waiting in queue. And, you know, some of the newspapers carried these articles. They talked about the migrant workers who crowded the bus stations to catch a bus to go back home carrying their children and bags, including women. They were standing in long queues, sometimes three kilometers, sometimes four kilometers, in hope to catch any bus to return to their homes, to their distant villages. It could be UP, it could even be Madhya Pradesh, it could be Bihar, sometimes Bengal. Now, all these people were waiting, waiting to go back home. Obviously, there were no buses. They were just, you know, desperate people. And desperate people call in desperate measures. 
the police, you know, the next day when we woke up around the 30th of March, I remember on television, we were confronted with pictures where police carrying batons were hitting men, women, children, just to disperse the masses. So the moment the lockdown started, it was a very, very painful situation for the people concerned, particularly poor people or migrant labor. Things became worse the next month and the month after that. In May, there was, in April actually, there was the other lockdown, the second lockdown. And when that lockdown started again, there were all these crowdings in the bus stations near the train stations. Nothing was working. By that time, the migrant laborers, whether men, whether women, we didn't find out too much about them. They were just a number to us. And they were crowding bus stations, train stations. They were being forced out of these places. And they were then trying to, those with some resources, trying to get some kind of vehicle to go back to their homes. So the interesting thing about these people is that they were considered as essential laborers from their homes because they were the people who would go to the cities and send remittances. But most of these, if you if you look at uh, you know um, the typologies of migrant worker in our country, you will see that most of these people are Dalits, are largely lower caste, poor, of course, without poverty. Why should they leave their home? And uh, you know, when rich people move, we say they're moving, they're relocating. Where poor people move, we know that they're being displaced. So these migrant laborers, they were, you know, maybe from regions where they were at one time historically considered as socially distanced because many of them belonged to the Dalit communities, the lower caste. They became migrant workers and then they graduated into the essential workers because of remittances, because of their social positioning, because when they came back home, they brought gifts, they had families, they had houses that they were building, etc. But then with the lockdown, these migrant laborers had to come back and suddenly they again became the socially distanced because the region, the area, the routes that they were taking, they were unwanted there. We heard stories about they being sprayed with insecticides, women dying. I remember reading in May about this 12-year-old girl who was going from uh, Karnataka, who was working in a chili factory in Karnataka, and she was walking all the way back to her home in Madhya Pradesh. And this poor, not even teenage, hardly teenage girl, died 100 kilometers from home because it was the month of May. So sheer dehydration, lack of food, all of these things were driving people to desperate measures. And they were taking these desperate measures because they wanted a life of dignity. They did not want to live on doles. They did not want to live on aid. They wanted a life of dignity. They came to their places, to the urban centers, wherever they came, because they wanted a life of dignity. What was happening was that not all of them could reach their home. So for want of dignity, for trying to get dignity, for the desire of dignity and a dignified life, they were actually facing death. So this is the, lab this is the story of migrant labor. So why did I start with this? Because all of us have now read Order of Things by Foucault. And uh, one of the first categories that we face there is epistemes. So everything has a prehistory. And truth and discourse are all 
based on that history, based on that genealogy. So that is why, you know, it is important now to understand why this discourse of feminist methodology or why this discourse of ethics have become so important for us. Because what we saw with the migrant labor brought into, you know, clear, absolutely focus, the problems in forced migration. When we talked about the migrant labors, we hardly ever had a gender desegregated data. We actually did not even have data. Because, you know, when the government of India was asked how many migrant labors there are, nobody could answer. It was the ILO data that we started working with. So, you know, certain things become important at certain historical juncture. And after COVID-19, its subsequent lockdown and the problems that the migrant labor faced, these questions have become very, very important for us to address. When you all in this class, you know, I'm giving you a few caveats. This lecture is not to be a straight jacket. What I say is for you to think about and probably to completely negate it. I'd be very happy if today after the lecture, people come up and say, you are speaking nonsense. I'd be very happy to get into that debate. But, you know, if you ask what is research, I have a quote here from one of the famous American sociologists, Earl Robert Babby, who says, research is a systematic inquiry to describe, explain, predict, and control the observed phenomena. It involves inductive and deductive methods. But if you ask me, what is research? I will say, research is all about wit and politics. Research has to be done sensitively and therein comes in your wit and politics. You know, I, as a feminist, believe that there is no objective research. Every research is subjective. You are researching on subjects which are based on your locations. And as Foucault says, epistemes, that is how epistemes are formed. And so every researcher is a political agent with a political purpose. And the thing that I'm going to work on is critical forced migration research. Now, I've been tasked to talk about feminist in input into this critical forced migration research. Why? Because the thing is, you know, feminist research started long back on critical forced migration. It is very easy for me to answer. The subjects of critical forced migration or the forced migrants are actually people who are constantly being feminized. Think of the Jews in Nazi Germany. They were constantly feminized because the subject of politics at that time was considered as a male subject. So people who were considered as unwanted, who were pushed out, who were shamed into leaving, they were all considered as feminine subjects. Now, why did this, you know, sort of, this is, this is not an easy correlation. This had happened again historically. The first time that the term feminine, you know, came into the discourse was in France, femina, you know, and, and at that time, it emerged out of medical practices in French hospitals. Certain bodies were supposed to imbibe what, you know, something to the moon, the lunar. And that is how we term it, you know, lunacy and all of that. So certain bodies imbibed that. Certain agentive bodies became completely in disarray because of too much of uh, spirits. And that sort of a body was considered as the feminine body. Alexander Dumas made a huge deal out of that. 
So, you know, from the beginning of the term feminism itself, there was a distinct division between what was considered as masculine and what was considered as feminine. The feminine was the emotional, but the masculine was the logical, the stark opposite of it, okay? And from that time on, we had this clear division between the masculine and the feminine in research itself. Now, in the 18th century and 19th century in England, when this term was thrown around, you know, there were understandings that feminisms and patriarchies had a symbiotic relations. And both were later considered as inventions of the colonial state. The colonial states needed the feminine and, you know, um, the colonial state also needed the patriarchies that controlled both the masculine and the feminine. You know, so research into what is known as feminine and masculine started from 19th and 18th century. However, the feminist movement actually was a later intervention into the discourse. And it came much later into forced migration because, uh, you know, the Seneca Falls, the 1848, we always remember 1848 because of uh, what? Communist Manifesto. However, there was another important thing occurring, and that was the Seneca Falls Declaration. So, you know, 1848, therefore, is very, very important. And then, you know, post-communist manifesto age, France was recognized as a country, as a nation, actually, that it was known. It was not a country at that point in time. It was a nation, and that nation had citoyens, the citizens. And in this citizenship, you know, it was heralded as a country with the first universal citizenship. But no, it was first universal male citizenship. With the you know, construction of the feminine, it became more and more difficult to access equality because the whole notion of feminine was created on inequality. And that inequality was actually based on hierarchy. So therefore, you know, when in the post, um, let's say, uh, Second World War era, Forced migration became a very important phenomena. It has to be recognized that, you know, by that time, most countries had given the rights of citizenship to women. But forced migrants were considered, or at that time, we never talked of forced migrants. Again, if we go by epistemes of Foucault, then we have to actually talk about refugees at that point. Now, refugees, because in 1951 convention, we have the refugee convention, we have the creation of a category of people where, you know, the interesting thing is in 1951 convention, when that convention was being debated, when it was being written, how many women do you think were in this hallowed hall who were participants in that debate, who were consulted? So can anybody tell me how many women were there in that consultation for the 1951 convention? None, none, not a single one. So is it any surprise that the category of women was not even there in the 1951 convention? It was later surreptitiously brought in as a specific social group that would be persecuted. Interestingly, it was not just the question of feminine that was missing. It was also the notion of justice that was missing. But there were notions of persecution. There were notions of fear. Who are the people who are associated with these characteristics of fear 
of persecution. It was the women. The women were considered as fearful. The men never feared. The women were the persecuted. So there was this easy relationship with victimhood, vulnerability, and women. Hence, when forced migration developed as a field of study, there was no need to gender desegregate the data because all the forced migrants were considered as feminine subjects, or similar to feminine subjects. Hence, forced migrants were not supposed to have a voice. They were not given a voice. One of the first thing that refugees lose is their right to speak for themselves. Today, we speak a lot about the identity refugees. But even then, that has not changed. Who represents themselves? The refugees do not represent themselves. There are other people, the lawyers, who intercede on their behalf. Why? Because forced migration or refugee studies, when it became a subject, the whole notion was on the question of how to manage it. And mistakenly, it was considered that, you know, this wave, this critical mass of refugees would be coming and sort of drowning the developed world. Now, the thing is, you know, initially when this notion of forced migrants emerged, as we all know, it was a Eurocentric notion. Nobody really realized that decolonization would begin very soon. Actually, it had already begun, which is amazing. Because if you look at Palestinian refugees or the partition refugees of India, that started before 1951. And yet, you know, those people were not considered as refugees within this definition of refugeehood. They were considered as partition refugees or other forms of refugeehood. And, you know, their rights are completely different and their liabilities are also very different. Now, the thing is, when after 51 Convention, we have this group of refugees, it was never considered that the refugees would represent themselves. So in certain ways, when you become a re refugee, you are shorn of your masculinity. So there was no need to have a feminine category of refugees. That came much later when it was recognized that even among the refugees, there is patriarchy involved. Now, the thing is, from the beginning, when we talk about refugee studies, refugees were a category that was meant to be governed. It was a governance category. It was governed, it was to be, you know, this whole notion of governmentality and refugees were within that framework of governing, the mentality, you know, within the framework of governance. And that is why, you know, if you look at the discourse of refugee studies, you will see that it was lodged from the beginning. And this is another thing that we have in common with feminist studies. The refugee studies, the post-migration studies, and feminist studies are both studies, critical studies, which were developing in conjunctions with the events that were occurring. So without movements, without events, there would be no feminist studies. And without movements, there would be no refugee studies. So because of the post-colonial, the decolonizing uh, groups of population, we had to develop or the world had to come to terms with something called refugee studies. And the thing, the, the whole notion was how to govern them and how to keep them at bay. One has to realize the 1951 convention was not meant as a convention to include refugees. This was a convention that was meant to find out how to exclude groups. Because by that time, when the 51 Convention was being debated, already decolonization had started. So although the backdrop was, was the, um, the uh, European refugees from the East, the fear was 
the refugees from the rest of the world, Asia and Africa. And then, you know, one of the main drivers of refugee studies is race. Often, nowadays, whenever we talk about refugees discourse, we forget the fact that there was racism. We often talk about religion, we talk about, you know, a whole gamut of things, politics, etc. But we never consider racism. Now, you know, when with critical studies, post-migration studies, it is scholars from the global south who are bringing these discourses in, you know, this, this notions. But again, it's facile to call it a global south because there is no homogenized global south. Even, you know, there are pockets of the north within the south. It's, it's much more complicated. And we can, you know, there is a question, we can discuss it at length. So, you know, you had the imagery of a hapless refugee who came to ask for asylum in the global north, but that never happened. Most of the refugees that were from the global south would not access the global north. Only those that were privileged among these refugees, economically privileged among them, they could access the global north. Okay. So because there was a, you know, clear recognition that even though there are no women in the refugee convention, post-migration is a phenomena that is informed by gender sensitivities. The forced migrants are definitely gendered subjects. Therefore, from, you know, from the time that we started developing what was considered as uh, the critical forced migration studies, we had to come to terms with one of the players of this critical forced migration studies, and they are the women, okay, within the critical forced migration studies. Now, before I talk about, you know, feminists within critical forced migration, feminism within critical forced migration studies, let me talk about methodology. In social sciences, methodology is taken to be a discipline which borders on philosophy, whose function is to recommend and examine methods which would be used to produce valid knowledge. Again, the stress over validity. I will come to this question of validity when I come to the portion where I talk about ethics. Methodology lays down procedures to be used in generation of valid philosophical knowledge and arguments. It is clear that methodologies claim to prescribe correct procedure to social science presupposes a form of knowledge that is thought to be provided by philosophy. Hence my invoking of Foucault at the beginning. In this sense, methodology presupposes a particular kind of rel relationship between philosophy and the social sciences, where judgment and validation of the claim to knowledge is possible. Different philosophies may conceive of that relationship in different terms, and to that extent, each discourse describes a different regime of truth. So the first thing that feminist knowledge, feminist methodology does is debunk this notion of truth. Again, feminists were the early Foucauldian. So, you know, we do not believe in the truth or one regime of truth but multiple truths, okay, regimes of truth. Okay, now I will come to the notion of critical epistemology. An enquiry is good if knowledge possesses, according to critical epistemology, if it has the property of historical situatedness care taken about social, political, economic, cultural, ethnic, gender specificities. 
According to constructivism, trustworthiness, criteria of credibility, transferability, dependability, and confirmability, and authenticity are the criteria of fairness. So it has to be ontologically authentic, and also it has to be catalytic. So that is critical, you know, my two bits about critical epistemology. Okay, now I will come to this notion of what is feminist methodology or methodological influence in a research. There are multiple ways of looking at it. At one point of time, there was this whole notion, which I'm sure all of you have heard about it, ab and star. Scholars were supposed to recover and reappropriate women's work. And in this way, they were supposed to eliminate sexism and androcentrism. There is, however, severe problem in this method because it leaves powerful androcentric tendencies in place. It falsely suggests that there are only those activities that men thought worthwhile to study are the ones that should shape our social life. It ignores how concentration on reproduction, mothering, care effects, the state, political economy, and the role of institutions which are largely powered by men, guided by men, that they have a special significance. And it stops us from understanding women's contributions in public life. So in forced migration studies, obviously, we cannot add and stir because this whole edifice that is based on a gendered notion of citizen and non-citizen is replicated within post-migration. And that is why if you just follow an add and stir method, we would be falsely creating a reality which is actually a male and a masculine reality. Again, we have to understand that you know, if we look at the state as male centric and the forced migrants as the other, then we have this proclivity of considering forced migrants as those that are dominated by or victimized by the state or a masculine victimization. And these are largely because they are people of color, like in colonialism. So, you know, if you look at it that way, then we are completely, you know, giving in to victimologies. We are creating false impressions that women have only in post-migration been victim. We are taking away from women's role as social agents. I will tell you a story. Once, you know, CRT, Calcutta Research Group, did a wonderful work that was called The Voices. And we were supposed to travel in eight refugee camps in South Asia. I did not, uh, you know, I was one of the coordinators of that study. I did not go to eight camps, but I went to a few. And there, everywhere that I went, I saw that the people who were desperately trying to cope the people who were desperately trying to resist dominance and the people who were desperately trying to hope were largely women. So, you know, we cannot give in to victimologies. We cannot give in to, you know, this hopelessness within critical forced migration studies. So one has to look at the, the practices that are there and construct theories on the basis of practices. And in practices, we have seen that, you know, in critical forced migration studies, gender plays a very important role. And, uh, you know, even now, when we talk about gender, it is largely in the field of theory. Suchurita Shengupto is right here. She works on Rohingya refugees. 
we are constantly extolling some of the virtues of leadership given by the Rohingyas. But very frankly, when you look at the public domain, the place of discussion on the fate of the refugees, this is largely the domain of the male and not the domain of the female, not the domain of the feminine. Because, you know, um, what happens is that, uh, as we have said, women are still considered as emotional. So if you give into the structured notion of, you know, the divisions of forced migration studies between the traditional male and the feminine domains, we will keep extolling the logical and not the emotional and, you know, uh, power and not care, etc. So before I come to any conclusion about this, I will now move slowly into the ethics of care because understanding forced migration has to be an understanding of ethics, study of ethics. Because forced migration, again, I said, is based on politics, based on location. To do, to do you know, all of this, all of my lecture today is to give you some insights into how what a good research on forced migration can be all about. What, and I consider a feminist research to be a good research, the feminism prism to be a good prism in forced migration studies. So for that to understand, to understand that prism, to understand what a good research is, it is important because I have told you before, I, again, I will reiterate because I cannot reiterate it enough and that is a researcher is a political being and what is being researched is also a political subject and i always believe that there is always good research and bad research you know and good research is based on good politics and bad research is based on bad politics and to practice good politics one has to and feminist politics one has to actually pay attention to it is very, very important. Okay, let us turn towards ethics. The first thing that forced migration studies invokes is this whole notion of care, ethics of care. Now, I made a lot of notes on ethics of care because um, Carol Gilligan, as you know, is one of the first people who talked about the ethics of care. And uh, Carol Gilligan's notion was that that you know, ethics of care is actually, care is actually a moral domain. And she argued that um, it must be, you know, the domain of morality must be extended to include care. And uh, so, Carol Gilligan had a limited sort of understanding of care. She so wanted to bring in it's within the notion of morality. However, there were other people like Ned Noddings, Joan Tronto, who talked about how cultural processes have actually transformed this into a concept of female morality. So there was an easy slide of the ethics of care into an understanding of female morality. So who was supposed to be practitioners. Now, Carol Gilligan was actually very clear about the fact that care was actually a two-way principle. There were caregivers and there were care receivers. And she did not make any value judgment about the caregivers and the care receivers. However, this value judgment about caregivers was, um, you know, a subsequent development. And one has to understand that Carol Gilligan was in the 80s. So one has to look at the whole situation in Bosnia, you know, the Kosovo, the Bosnia, all these conflicts, post migration starting out of, I told you about decolonization and race as being one of the movers. I'm talking about ethics of care now in the context of Bosnia because we had this notion of wide-scale rape. Rape 
being used as an instrument of war during the Bosnian. Now, the interesting thing is, again, this is very racist, because rape was used previously when you think of the Bangladesh crisis. But it never became a subject of discourse you know, at that point of time. It was driven under and it was mostly forgotten. But the Bosnian crisis and the American academics brought up this whole notion of rape. And that is why I think this was the time when ethics of care became a very, very important mover to understand post-migration. While post-migration was being, you know, was becoming an emergent field where ethics of care was being talked about for people like, as I said, Don Pronto and Carol Gilligan to an extent, Ned Noddings and all these people, um, you know, Sarah Ruddick, of course. Um, she talked about motherhood and later we brought this notion of motherhood into understanding post-migration, gendered relationship, into understanding caregiving. There was also another notion, and that was the ethics of justice. Now, the ethics of justice, again, was considered as an ethics of masculinity, an ethics which, um, you know, which said that there cannot be any value judgment about it. Because, you know, one has to look at the intrinsic value of what is right and what is wrong. Now. How can we make the intrinsic value judgment? You know, the ethics of justice talks, talked about and centered on this whole notion of equity. A characteristic is of Hobbes' notion of masculinity and its dimension. It is meant to be driven by merit and not by nurturance. So, you know, nurturance was a false value according to ethics of justice. Again, this, which is considered, the ethics of justice is considered as an egalitarian theory, and it has a communitarian approach, because justice also stresses this whole notion about societal virtues, which is more, you know, when we look at this whole question of societal virtues, we, you know, shape a notion of justice which is devoid of emotion. My understanding is that sort of a notion of justice is based on false premises. Because as we look at ethics of care, we will understand that care is also value-led. And, you know, there cannot be justice that is without value addition. I will come to this problem very soon. Andrew Shatnov has argued in 1995 and, uh, sorry, 1998, 1985 and 86, I think, that refugees are persons whose basic needs are actually unprotected by the country of their origin. And that is why this whole notion of persecution. Now, if you look at ethics of justice, if you look at equity, then you will be probably buying into the notion of persecution as Venetiar presupposes it. That persecution is a conceptual tool through which one can determine who are the most, uh, you know, who are the most important subjects or the most deserving subjects of asylum. However, you know, if you, if you make that sort of a value judgment on the basis of what even HCR does, you are actually, again, falling into a trope where we are looking at two ethics from an institutional perspective. Ethics has multiple sides. The ethics of state is one side, but there is also the ethics of the forced migrants themselves. And there is also ethics of these institutions. So again, you know, you have to understand that this is all 
a notion of location. Location is very, very important because, you know, you can say that um, a forced migration is a person who is being persecuted and, you know, on the basis of so and so and so, we can say that this person is persecuted and this person deserves asylum. But the point is, you know, much of women's persecution is not based on state persecution. It is much more cross-cutting. For example, female genital mutilation. Female genital mutilation is not a persecution that is done by the state. It is done by the patriarchies of specific societies. For example, societies of Africa. And that is why in ethics of care, we often say that is very close to the African feminine ethics. And, and, and so, you know, because these questions, feminists were able to bring these questions to the table where it was recognized that people, you know, who were being pers persecuted were not just persecuted by state. There were other sources of persecution, other types of persecution. And that is why today, female genital mutilation is considered as a ground for forced uh, migrants to get asylum. Now, again, we are talking of epistems. At certain point, certain discourses, certain categories, certain truths emerge. So why, you know, why did this female genital mutilation became a subject of uh, asylum, you know, being women becoming um, or being victimized or even those who have already been mutilated, they are given asylum by. Then again, you know, you, this whole notion of ethics becomes very confused when you look at Michael Walser. Because Walser says location is important and people who were able to go to the so-called developed world and get into, they should not be thrown out. But if you look at it from an ethical perspective, if people who were allowed to become refugees it is ethical to accept them as migrants. Then, you know, who are these people who can access resources to become refugees? Largely, these are men, young men. All resources of the, of the family is put onto these young men. It is given to these young men, and they are able to go to you know, third countries or wherever and seek asylum and get asylum. What about largely the women, the old, the infirm who are back in the country where they're being persecuted and who stay there as IDPs? So, you know, where is the ethics in that? If you consider that because these people get in, could get into a country, they should be given asylum then what happens to the people who could not get into that country? What happens to the IDPs themselves? So you see, Michael Walzer is considered as one of those grand figures in ethics of justice within forced migration study, but it denies the whole understanding or it pitches the whole understanding on a masculinist notion of justice. There is femininity in it. You know, there is the feminine in it. So that is why, you know, now progressively critical forced migration studies is being pushed by feminists from the global south who are pushing into a different understanding of forced migration studies where it would be understood that because forced migration is and the forced migrants are understood as a category that is, you know, less than masculine. Therefore, femininity should be posited on this whole notion of justice and care. And research should begin from a gendered understanding of the characters of forced migration and also from an understanding that, uh, you know, 
notions of care, notions of emotion, notions of body, all of these need to be brought into a critical understanding of post migration studies. For a good research on post migration, we need to bring in certain questions because, you know, what is a feminist research? What is an ethical research? Both feminist research and forced migration research is posited on but one, one politics is itself, and that is the liberation, the emancipation of the forced migrants and the emancipation of vulnerability. So, you know, we have to appropriate and say, yes, emotions are important. Emotions are drivers. Emotions are not something that makes femininity less accepted than masculinity. And, you know, there are specific roles that, you know, women can do that doesn't necessarily make them essentialist. That makes them that gives them the added advantage and added advantage to equity because motherhood is something that informs a, a person's psyche, both male and female, and that has to be respected. That has to be recognized. So a good research on forced migration takes all of these into our understanding. And with it comes our understanding that everything that we understand in terms of institutions and state is based on an understanding as drivers of power. So to do a good research, we have to do something that intervenes in that power, in that power relation. We have to make power more equitable. We have to challenge that power and work towards emancipation of the people concerned or the forced migrants. So good research cannot be replicated with only feminist understandings. It has to be a good feminist research, which is ethical, in any way, because femininity, feminism, feminist subject, feminist movement, whichever way you look at it, is based on a corrective politics. It does not say that men are bad or men are unequal or throw the men away. It never does. That's a very simple understanding of femininity. In fact, it looks at subjects such as post migrants and looks at it as an object to study because there has to be a corrective of politics of the forced migration studies as such and discourses as such. And it also shifts the truth. It, it understands the truth. It recreates the truth in its own paradigm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Shamata, I'm ready to take questions. Yes, uh, right. So uh, thank you, Pallavi. I would invite... Uh, Okay, somebody has clapped. I don't know who that is, but somebody's clapped after your lecture. There is already a question in the chat box. Uh, Nasreen has also raised a hand. Okay, we'll come to Nasreen later. But okay, this was Shujurita's question. She uh, congratulates you for the excellent talk and for bringing up the question of subjectivity. Uh, one question that is often faced by researchers working on critical force migration, including herself, is... Why is gender not a recurrent theme throughout the work and needs or deserves a separate chapter? She was asked this when she was presenting her fieldwork and chapter ideas. Would you like to reflect on this? Yes, of course. Yes, you know, as Ranovida constantly evokes Marx and says that one of these days, you know, the state will wither up then we will not have to take the notion of state separately. You know, it will be other categories. I wish gender withers away and we are all informed as gendered subjects. You know, we all become gendered subjects. But now when that is not possible, that is why we have to highlight because gender, I don't know, I think gender is intrinsic to any study, you know, so when people ask me, what is it, you know, what are the topics of understanding in gender studies? I, I am flammoxed because to me, the world is, you know, our, of our interest. But the point is, because one doesn't 
understand as to how intrinsically gender informs forced migration. That is why, you know, it, it is all very well to say that it has to be informed in all the chapters. Very good. But why do we need a necessary chapter 10 on that? Because it is so critical, so intrinsic to research on forced migration that we have to sort of flag it, flag it at the beginning and say that when we talk about intersectionalities, we're very happy to talk about intersectionalities. This has become the trope word for everybody, Anthropocene, this, that, intersectionality. Yes, but one of the most intersectional of the issues is gender. And yet we always conflate it to just mean women, which is not correct, because refugee studies is replete by you know, feminist works on masculinities. So that is why we have to flag this notion of gender because there is so much of misconstruction, misunderstandings about it. And also because one of these days, masculinities and femininities would wither away and we would become a value neutral subject. I don't know how that is possible, but anyway, even then probably gender remains because it is not that day we have to flag gender, just as Ronovida has to flag state, I guess. Thank you, Pallavi. Uh, okay, I have an order of questions that are to be asked. So I'm going to say this order first. So next we have Kosturi Dotto, then we have Sheikh Rafikullah, then we have Indira. So Kosturi, will you go first? Uh, so I was, my question is basically, you know, uh, it is a very essential framework that you provided and it is just not like a different framework, but it has to be integrated within uh, studying the different concerns we have. Uh, my question is that in the international legal regime on refugees and migrants, uh, can we, how can we critically understand this concept of protection? You know, can we see this as a gendered concept, especially when you're using the term, uh, you're reflecting on the term nurturance, uh, you know, uh, social protection vis-a-vis -vis migrants and similarly asylum seekers and protection in case of refugees, how gendered that terminology is in international law? That is what I was inter <clears throat> interested to know. Yeah. Very good question. Can I take a bunch of questions and then reply? Yes, please. So uh, Rafikullah, will you ask your question next? Hello, good evening, ma'am. Good evening. It was an excellent critique of um, refugee uh, studies or uh, migration since the post uh, Second World War. But uh, as you said, uh, research is more about subjectivity. So, like, uh, I was expecting, like, we are newcomers, like, they totally new to the stream of refugee studies. So, I really wanted to know your practical experiences, the research method. I want to know about research methods while interviewing refugees, especially women. It will be like, uh, what are the problems that uh, a researcher faces when he is on the field? Like, if, if, if I'm a man, how would I research a woman uh, on the field, like in the camp? So I, I would like to know more about the field experiences. Uh, what kind of ethic one should follow uh, while interviewing or studying uh, migrants, uh, refugees? you reflect more on that thank you absolutely and, absolutely and we'll take one more question now uh indira will you ask your question yes good evening ma'am thank you so much for your uh, very enlightening lecture and uh, since i'm a newcomer into this field so it is all the more enlightening for me as well um, it's just a, uh, it's just a very general reflection. I mean, you were talking about, uh, you know, uh, something about how refugees has been equated with femininity because they have been shorn of masculinity. I was wondering, ma'am, can we really say then that, uh, you know, just because refugees are dispossessed, they are disempowered, and uh, they uh, they they. Uh, probably his own property, if you have to really say that way. Uh, is it because of that, uh, that it is equated with femininity? Or, I mean, uh, since women have always been, I mean, historically, if you see that women have always been, uh, you know, uh, somehow associated with uh, 
being dispossessed, uh, I mean, dis disowning uh, property rights and several uh, such things like that, I mean, rights such as uh, possessing property or uh, as in citizenship or if you, for that matter to say that. I mean, can we really say that that way? Yeah, you know, um, I will go on reverse order, okay? Masculinity question first, then uh, ethics of research, and then the notion of protection. Okay, now, the thing is, actually, the notion of protection and masculinity comes together, I would say, because what is masculinity? What are the masculine attributes? Who is a man? Can we define a man? You know, what are the qualities that come with men? I think one of the first thing that we consider to be masculine is the ability to protect your people, your women. You are supposed to be able, both women and children, at one point of time, were considered as subjects of male dominance. Remember, um, when, what was it, the third president of the United States, when he was going to uh, Philadelphia to discuss about this notion of citizenship. You know, his wife, um, she wrote to him saying, please don't forget the women. You know, they also deserve to be citizens. But, you know, women are easily forgotten because men are supposed to be not only the protectors of women. So remember, 100 years back, or maybe 150 years back, in most countries, a man could hit his wife with a stick which is not thicker than your little finger. And that was completely legal. Even 50 years back, uh, 50 years, yes, 50 years back, in France, women, before taking up a job, had to have the permission of either their father or their husbands. So to be a man, you are supposed to protect your property and women are supposed to be protected. So as a refugee, that is the first thing you're shown of. You know, you become that character. Why was it so easy? for Nazis to, fem to feminize Jews because Jews were emasculated. They could not protect their families. They could not protect themselves. So they became objects. So, you know, um, Rafiqullah, Sheikh Rafiqullah, one of the first thing in a good research is to understand that your subjects of research are not objects. You're dealing with human beings. So, you know, I can rattle off saying, take triangulation method, do constructivist thing, don't be essentialist, blah, blah, blah. If you want that, I can send you a PowerPoint that I do for my class. But at your level, if you're doing research, there are certain given, and that is human beings are not subjects. Human beings are not objects. They're human beings, okay? And... That is why, you know, we consider this ethics of care when I talked about it. One of the most important things that it encapsulates is this ethics of protection. From care, we sort of come to this whole notion of protection. And that is why the primary concern for people who are forced migrants and, you know, in governance of forced migrants is this notion of protection. Because if you are not being able to protect the people that you are governing, why do we need a state? Why is there even a state? A state is there to protect its citizens or the people who are residing within it. That is the primary role of a state in terms of governance. So protection is that fundamental to politics, to statehood, to everything. And shown of protection you are often considered as emasculated. And so, you know, that is why I talk about refugee group as a group that is in many cases gendered because they are feminized. And again, the other thing that makes a man a man 
is a man's proximity to power. Remember, even when we have great feminine leaders like Indira Gandhi, what did we say about you? People are too young to know. But anyway, what did we say about Indira Gandhi's cabinet? If you read about Indira Gandhi, you will see that the oft repeated terminology was in Indira Gandhi's cabinet, there was only one man, and that was Indira Gandhi. And, you know, Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher appropriated all the feminine, with all the masculine qualities. Even today, you know, Didi, who is extremely gendered, um, invokes feminine qualities, invokes, you know, this notion of nurturance, this notion of protection, That and that is how she's different from a lot of female leaders because she invokes all these feminine qualities. But what has she done? From looking at her, she has completely made herself asexualized. She's Didi. She's Amma. She's, you know, something. She's a gendered relative. So they become, you know, you don't lassie it when you look at a Didi. You don't. She's shown off makeup. What did Queen Elizabeth I do? She painted her face white. She was, all the leaders have to make themselves asexualized because sexuality is threatening. Sexuality cannot be put within straight jacket and governments cannot run without putting things in straight jacket. So that is why it is very, very important to understand the notion of gender. And if you look, talk about you know, research, Rafiq, I will say the first thing that you have to understand is that you're dealing with human beings. And again, to invoke another feminist category, you're dealing with people, their beliefs, their trust, and their emotions. So it is very, very important. You know, often we say that we have done ethnic research. We have done ethnographical research. And what do we do? We go and interview certain people for 45 minutes. In our qualitative description, we say, okay, 31 people have been interviewed for 45 minutes each. That is not ethnographical research. That is not, you know, to me, all these methodologies doesn't matter. I always consider myself, I say I'm very undisciplined because I do not follow a straight jacket of discipline. I think of myself as a feminist and I believe that there might be any kind of methodologies and I'm supposed to disturb those methodologies. A feminist research is meant to disturb the straight jacket of methodologies or disciplinary, you know, barriers. We have to break those disciplinary barriers because otherwise, you know, the moment we make it a discipline, then we lose the feminist subjectivity. We lose the power of feminism, if I might say so. And and so, you know, any the moment you know you stop disrupting the essential, you know, the power-driven categories that are given to us you stop becoming a feminist or a person who does good feminist research. So one of the most important things is to relate to your people. I'm talking about your people, the people that you have to address, people whose problems you consider as important enough to work on. And you know these are the people, the first thing that you have to establish in a good research, you ask me, what is a good research? A good research is a good political research. And a good research, a good political research is based on trust. So the first thing that you have to do is to create a relationship of trust with the people that you are researching. How many of you do a research and then go back to the people concerned and say, this is the thing, this is my results, or this is the result of my research. None of us do it, but that is how you should do it. If you're working on human beings, you're not God. You have to relate to these human beings. You have to understand. I'm not saying that you have to be part of that community, but you have to understand that community. You have to relate to that community. You have to, you know, that is the ethics from the perspectives of the forced migrants who will tell you what is important to them and what is not. The women that I worked with told me the most important thing for them was to 
send their children to school. You know, and no point in telling them that you're not a feminist because you're looking after, you're nurturing. They don't understand that, but they understand the basic thing that they have to protect their family. The nurturance has a lot to do with protection. And, you know, when individuals are unable to protect, to, to share this notion amongst their own people, that is when we look towards the state. So even though people who are forced migrants think of themselves as emasculate, you know, they are not masculinized enough or they are emasculated, but the failure is that of the state because it is the state that is meant to protect. That is why, that is the basic existence of the state itself. And that is why, you know, if you've done research among post-migrants, you will see that men find it so difficult, so difficult to exist as, as post-migrants. Because in countries from South Asia, women are taught to be dispossessed. Women are taught to be displaced. We have a training of living in displacement. From age three, our parents start talking about us as the jewel who will be transferred to another family. You know, this whole discourse is actually built so that you can displace people, women, from property that is not, uh, you know, that cannot be easily converted into cash. So, you know, and instead, you put those glorious terms as the jewel of the family who has to be given as a present to another family. That is all nonsense. It is basically taking away women's rights. So, you know, we have to understand what these things are. But women are trained much better to operate in displacement because women's relationship is not with power, is not so much with faith, with state, but largely with, its, with their own networks. So if that is why we say when a whole uh, village is uprooted and rehabilitated, it is much better because women find their networks. Women are able to create their networks. But when they become individually forced migrants, it becomes difficult to create those networks. That is why women find it difficult, you know, to carry on their lives. So good research is based on good politics, as I'm saying, and that is based on your relationship with your, you know, your people that you are researching. And that has to be based on trust. That has to be based on ethic. That has to be based on an emancipatory policy. Uh, so I had promised that Nasreen will ask the second next question. But before Nasreen, I am going to read out Vishwajit's question because it is extremely connected to what you just said. After that, Nasreen will ask her question and then Deborshi will ask his question. So Bishwajit has asked, do you think that domestic labor and ethics of care are contradictory? Ethics of care can be instrumental in exploiting women's labor at the domestic and public sphere. Okay, next up is Nasreen. Nasreen, will you ask your question? Thanks, Shamata. Um, I think, you know, one of the phenomenal aspect of Paula, and if I may say so, is uh, the best actually comes out during her Q&A. So I'm going to take the liberty and just, you know, probe a little more because... I think this is such a huge opportunity. You know, I, I have listened to you, Paula, I don't know how many times. Uh, but I must say, you know, these are very, very probing questions and your responses are very intense. So I'm actually thinking of a project in a very different way. All your lectures should be now recorded. And actually, we should do something about it. No, I, I'm, I'm very serious about it. Uh, because, you know, the response that you kind of said, I mean, I had a different set of, I would say question, just to continue the conversation because I think it's important to have you on the forum to get a sense of you know the question of gender and the way you see gender is not necessarily the same as all feminists. So there is no one way of you know studying gender also. So you know somewhere I think the question for global south and the way we have termed global south seems to be an homogeneous entity. As if there is you know it's devoid of any kind of politics and devoid of, you know, or there's an agency question is so supreme and all women have voices. But as, you know, as you would know, but that's not the case. So my question, I mean, I won't say question, I'm, I may just want to kind of push you a bit to say that, you know, in a post-colonial context, uh, why is it that we find that 
you know, gender question or question related to women and subjectivity seems to be so low down. I mean, and, and, and we talk about 51, we talk about 69, we talk about a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, but whenever we talk about labor, you know, we, we leave the women aside. Uh, when we talk about body, yes, the maps are drawn on the body of the women, and yet they are the dispossessed, right? So, you know, my I, I just want to push you to think that, you know, is there a politics of within Global South where, you know, the African context is different than the South Asian context? And are we necessarily not speaking to each other or have we really missed the bus? You know, because if we have missed the bus, then that is really a huge problem. Uh, so I'm kind of curious because, you know, in a conversation, I you recall somebody was mentioning, oh, but there is no post-colonial understanding. It is decolonial understanding, you know. So my contention is why do we have different language? If the politics is so same, does that really matter? And should it really matter? So not a question, it's more like, you know, I just want your, your, your thoughts because I'm sure all of us will really immensely, you know, benefit from it. Thank you. So okay. uh, Pallavi, why don't you go ahead, address these two and we'll see whether we can reach out to them. Okay, absolutely. I actually, you know, missed uh, Bishwajit's question. Or two, but I will read it out again. Do you think that domestic labor and ethics of care are contradictory? Ethics of care can be instrumental in exploiting women's labor at the domestic and public sphere. That is the question. Yes, absolutely. I have no conflict with that. I am not proposing ethics of care as, uh, you know, as sort of, uh, how should I put it, as the panacea. You know, this, this is not, um, this is not, I told you, I, I in fact talked about ethics of care and the creation of victimologies, you know. So I, I understand that ethics of care can be used to victimize women. But then what is not, you know, ethics of justice also creates, you know, hierarchies of vulnerability. Who is the most equitable? Who is the most vulnerable? Who deserves protection? Where is justice all of, in all of this? So, you know, all of these are different sites that can be utilized in a research. So that is why I keep saying that, you know, we have to be undisciplined. We have to be scavengers. We have to be, because feminist research is still an emerging field. And I feel we haven't seen the last of it. So, you know, the reason why I invoked ethics of care is because I feel very strongly about these whole notions of logic and emotion and, and, and these binaries. We often say that we don't believe in binaries, but these binaries keep appearing and reappearing in our texts, in our contexts, and in everything. And, and so that is why, you know, I, I, I posit it as something where we can try to get away from these binaries, where, where we can celebrate emotions, you know, where why we here we is not just the feminine. I'm talking about we as in human beings, you know, we can celebrate emotions. We can, we can talk about our shame. We can correct the shame. We can also understand our vulnerabilities and we can also be respectful of those vulnerabilities, you know. Vulnerabilities doesn't necessarily make you a victim or a recipient of dole or aid. So I completely, you know, I don't think we are in opposition to each other when I'm talking about ethics of care. It is just one instrument of doing research, but no good research is done out of one instrument. And I keep saying to me, the only sort of, uh, how do I put it? The only thing, that cannot be sort of thrown away is this politics of emancipation. If you want to work towards a politics of emancipation 
through your research. If that is your goal, that is the only, and to me, that is the only way to do feminist research. You know, as far as Nasreen's questions, Nasreen, it is, as you know, this is something which is very, very important, what you're suggesting, because why is the post-colonial always the colonies? Why is not the colonizers the post-colonial? Why are the post, you know, the colonizers always the post-imperial? Because there is there is a lot of, you know, baggage that is associated with this whole notion of the colon of the colonizers and the people who've been colonized so if we look at history then you know there are experiences which are very specific for example indian indian experiences of a colony is uh, not that of algeria these are different experiences maghreb countries experiences of a colony is different from, you know, um, the other, from Southeast Asia, from Southeast Asia, South Asia. So certainly this is not homogenized. I keep saying that whenever we talk of Global South, actually the terminology of Global South is something that is not, you know, a terminology that was brought in Global South. We have to understand the location, you know, again, epistem. From where did the terminology start? The terminology was, of course, from the developed world. They wanted to club together the Asian and African experiences and, and, and talked about post-coloniality. You know, I, I, not that I um, believe in all of these uh, terminologies, but, but that is why you know, the Chakravarti and all these people never talk about post-coloniality, but, you know, there is a merit to understanding our experiences as post-colonial, but that's certainly not homogeneous. These experiences cannot be homogenized. African experiences has its own specificities and Asian or South Asian experiences, Middle Eastern experiences. But when we are doing the research, how many fractures are we willing to make? Because we have to, you know, contest both the developing world and the world that they have created of that mind base. So there is a global north within the global south, multiple sides of global north, where we have the client bases. And I'm not going to talk about here about who are the clients, but there are many, many clients who become collaborators with the research that is being done in the global north, they they have access, you know, just like colonialism in different parts of the world, there were collaborators. The same way today, there are collaborators for whom it is, it is important to keep this division of the global north and the global south. And then the main purpose, I think now, to make this division and to homogenize global south and not talk about its specificities is to say that there is limited resources to be sent because capital is still largely concentrated in the global north. So it is it is very easy to say oh, we are the we are working with post-colonial countries. It is all a question of resources. We are sending resources to the developing world. We are working in well, you know, the global south. But the point is what that politics does is to pit against one group of global south to the other. The other. So, you know, exactly the way colonialism practiced divide and rule, the same way today, the politics of global north and global south is on the same trajectory of divide and rule. And that is why Africans are being pitted against Indians or Asians or whatever, or, you know, when you're talking about IDPs, should we send the resources to Colombia or should we send it to Nepal for the earthquake? You know, there's always these hierarchies. There is always these, you know, typographies and there is always these gradations that your ethics of justice promotes. And, and that is why I said one of the correctives we should do to come back to you for this ethics of justice can be 
to utilize the ethics of care as well into the research and say that you know this cannot be accepted and i don't think we have missed the bus stream it is still it is still possible that you know there would be people there would be transformative uh, politics in many different parts post colonial countries where we can clearly remove the facade of you know of the rule of law that is practiced in the developing world and i think we are removing that facade today with this whole politics of vaccination and and you know to bring back my lecture to uh, 360 no no 180 or no 360 is to, i'm bad at mathematics is to bring it back to this whole question of politics of vaccination i started with you know migrant labor and i talked about why it is an epistemic moment to understand this course on post migration for particularly this course on feminist and ethical post post migration studies so critical post migration studies why it en encapsulates feminist and ethical studies and today to combat this whole notion of uh, you know pitting one against the other one has to really bring out this politics of vaccination which i think is one of the supreme examples of that particular politics that has been played out and i think we have reached the point voila no but we still have to take dr devoshi talukdar's question yes yes uh, devoshi if your mic is working uh, uh, yes. uh, 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 yeah. am i audible ma'am Yes, audible. I'm just very thirsty. Uh, 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 thanks uh, for your wonderful lecture, and it's a very thought-provoking lecture. And that lecture provokes me a simple question. Uh, I, being a student of sociology, uh, have, have been trained in research methodology in various ways. Uh, actually, there are two uh, rendition of research methodology. one is positivist research methodology and another one is hermeneutic tradition of research methodology and hermeneutic uh, tradition of research methodology has this question about the objectification that has been carried out in the name of survey research and you have clearly mentioned in in your lecture but uh, in the last instance uh, putting uh, althusser in the last instance if there is such thing so the if Uh, i am trying to write a report uh, so or, or i would trying to share the experience with the respondent quote unquote being a refugee from the from his or her perspective but that is speak not speaking to speaking with the refugee but in the last analysis the experience of that refugee that has been mediated by the researcher in the last instance so in a way being a student of sociology i have been disturbed that and it disturbed my self of the research researcher self in a way that in the final analysis i am writing my view point though i have set up a ethical or sensitive or empathetical engagement with that respondent that has been put aside by the positivist research methodology but ultimately the experience uh, is mediated by the researcher so the point of mediation is very critical to me that's my yes. question ma'am yes deboshi excellent question all of you you're all thinking and i'm so glad that this course is going so well because all of you are thinking very energetically and i'm very happy um your question actually needs a much longer answer than uh well i will try to shorten it um i please don't think i'm simplifying it i'm not trying to be simplistic i'm just trying to be um let's put it this way i'm not even trying to be trite or pretty i'm just trying to shorten it to give you a short answer and that is you cannot the mediator cannot remove oneself it is not possible so the point is 
what is being mediated and how the mediator is operating. I think the only way of emancipating yourself is to make sure, again, I'll come back to politics because that's what I understand, is to make sure that the politics is emancipatory. What is the purpose of your research? Is, is it merely trying to see what this group of forced migrants are doing? Then that research is actually of no value at all. Then your research has to be informed by political emancipation. And only then you can be an emancipatory mediator. We, uh, there's a wonderful book where we talk about the vanishing mediator, but you know, that is the only way where mediator can vanish and the politics of emancipation remains because otherwise, you know, what is the point of mediating? Because you have to work towards emancipation. You have to work towards, you know, liberation. And, and that is the whole purpose to me of research. So research for the sake of research is valueless. Anybody can do it, but to be, uh, a researcher, an ethical researcher, you have to make sure you have an emancipatory politics. That's the short answer. The long answer, you and me can talk about it at length. I can give you a link and we can have a discussion. Th thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Paladi. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for the seventh lecture of our course, Reading Refugees, Reading Migrants. Uh, which has been very generously supported by IWM Vienna. Uh, we shall see you tomorrow uh, for the lecture by Shifali Jha on digital ethnography in migration research. Thank you.